Okay. Can you hear me? <laughs> All right. Uh, I wish I were there with you, uh, but thanks to uh, the weather and the airlines, I was not able to make it. Um, this is a, a topic, autonomic function sleep, uh, that's going to be pretty hard to cover in just 20 minutes, but I will do my best. Okay. My slide advance is not working. All right. Okay, there we go. So, uh, those of you who have been here know now that the autonomic nervous system regulates most body processes and that autonomic dysfunction is very common in Ehlers-Danlos and other hypermobility-related syndromes and underlies many of their symptoms. Uh, I'm going to show you today that the most common type of sleep disorder seen in Ehlers-Danlos appears to have an autonomic basis. Okay, and this slide is out of place. <laughs> this is, uh, doctor says, no rest after counting the whole flock. You should be tested for sheep apnea. Uh, this is just a slide to make the point that sleep apnea is more common in hypermobile people, but a lot of times I see people for whom their sleep apnea is a relatively small factor in their sleep disorder, uh, and so treating it doesn't really take care of their sleep quality issues. So basics of the autonomic nervous system. Uh, I think you all know for now that the, uh, primarily composed of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. I find it helpful to think of the sympathetic system as the accelerator and the parasympathetic as the brake. So autonomic dysfunction in these syndromes um, has caused is uh, manifested by instability or fluctuations or what I call a failure to modulate stresses. Uh, some of my patients will say I only have two speed stop and full speed ahead. I also find it helpful to think about the concept of an adrenaline or energy reserve or having your own fuel tank uh, with the central paradox of the hypermobility associated dysautonomia as being that the more depleted your reserves get, the more your body responds to stress. So the more rundown you get, the more you overreact to minor stresses, and such overreactions can then trigger an overcorrection, which then may trigger you to go back the other way. And this looks like, I'll spare the details, but I will point out that during this part of the test, the patient is asked to stand, red is sympathetic, blue is parasympathetic. There's a small increase, but very transient increase in sympathetic activity on standing, and then very quickly the body does other things to maintain blood flow to the brain. In a patient with Ehlers-Danlos and autonomic dysfunction, standing stiggers, triggers too big a sympathetic surge, followed almost immediately by an even bigger parasympathetic surge. Too much gas, too much brake, then was too much better hit the gas again, better hit the brake again. And this person, like a lot of you, I'm afraid, has been standing for three months, three minutes. <laughs> standing for three minutes and is still trying to get their autonomic nervous system to behave and get blood flow to their brain restored. So this slide I include, and I'll, I'll show this again later, uh, to make the point that this type of autonomic dysfunction represents an imbalance in the autonomic nervous system rather than a permanent condition or any type of autonomic failure. Uh, in this patient, you can see almost a chaotic pattern while she was sick and almost a completely normal pattern later. So sleep misperception uh, is, a, is a common problem. A surprising number of patients say that they sleep fine, or they say things like, I'm a great sleeper, I can sleep anytime, anywhere. And I have to point out to them, no, I think that actually means you're not a good sleeper. The, the main question is to ask them, how do you feel when you get up? And patients will say, I never feel rested. I wake up feeling like I haven't slept. I don't think I know what feeling rested would feel like. Um, 
And I said, when you get up in the morning, are you ready to go for the day? Or do you want to just roll over and go back to sleep for two hours? And they say, of course, I want to go back to sleep for two hours. Doesn't everyone? Well, fortunately, not all of us do. Um, sleep misperception is a problem. Other types of sleep disorders, up to 90% of people with sleep apnea are not aware they have it. So pictures worth a thousand words. Here is uh, we call a hypnogram or sleep architecture. It's your sleep cycles through the night. So normally light sleep, deep sleep, shallow, REM, shallow, a little more deep sleep here, usually shallow REM, shallow REM. You can see a fairly regular cycle with most of the deep sleep early in the night. And this is a very typical pattern for someone with Ehlers Danlos who says, I sleep all night. I'm not choking and gagging. I'm not having wild dreams. I'm not in pain. Uh, I'm not thrashing around, but I wake up in the morning feeling like I haven't slept. And you'll see that this person has no deep sleep, has almost no REM. There's nothing that looks like a cycle. Uh, what you can't see here is that in the sleep lab, an awakening is defined as a disruption to the continuity of your sleep that lasts more than 30 seconds. Uh, and if the continuity of your sleep is, last, is disrupted for less than 30 seconds, that's called an arousal. In this sleep study, this patient had 23 awakenings and 125 arousals. So the continuity of her sleep was disrupted almost 150 times. Uh, imagine someone tapping on a shoulder every three or four, three or four minutes all night long. Uh, no wonder she wakes up not feeling rested. So what's behind all these disruptions and arousals? Well, here's a graph showing um, sleep stages and heart rate. And it's pretty clear that every time this person wakes up, lines up with a spike in their heart rate as if they're making little surges of adrenaline throughout the night. Here's one where the patient at least is trying to get into deep sleep, but you can see that each time she gets into deep sleep, she just comes right back out of it. And you see all these awakenings as well. Um, problem here is that a lot of sleep software will add up these little bits and say this person had 30 or 40 minutes of deep sleep when she really didn't have any significant you really need to get your deep sleep in a couple of big chunks. In this, um, this patient, for whatever reason, her autonomic nervous system was calm and quiet for a nice chunk here. And then you can see up here, she had an almost interrupted, uh, nice big chunk of deep sleep. The rest of the night, chaos, heart rate up and down and awakenings correlating with these heart rate spikes. So I put this slide in again to make the uh, unfortunate point made in the next slide. Uh, the MRI shows, sorry, this didn't turn out so well. The MRI shows your head is riddled with conventional wisdom. Unfortunately, most of you have the opposite problem of dealing with physicians whose heads are riddled with conventional wisdom. And the previous sleep study where the person had 125 arousals and 23 awakenings and no deep sleep was read as normal by a board certified sleep doctor. So one reason why the sleep doctors might, might call this normal is that it's well known that people don't sleep well during their first night in a sleep lab, or in fact, they don't sleep well in their first night in any new place. And that's been attributed to what's called a night watch or what I call on alert phenomenon, which is a protective mechanism to be vigilant for threats in a new environment. So it turns out an interesting study showed that actually one hemisphere of the brain is sleeping and the other is in a shallow state uh, watching for or, or being alert for so-called deviant stimuli. And the more the two sides of the brain were different, the more um, aroused the awake part was, the longer it took for the person to fall asleep. And that part of the brain that was not sleeping well had an enhanced response to deviant stimuli, like an unexpected noise causing more arousals and faster behavioral responses. Um, some of this uh, Dr. Husto alluded to yesterday. So unfortunately, this study was done with healthy people. And when they came back a second night and subsequent nights, they didn't see this. While in Ehlers-Danlos and related conditions, it seems as this every night has this first night problem. So here's a slide I'm always reluctant to include because it seems circular that to improve sleep, you have to improve your autonomic function and to improve autonomic function, you have to improve your sleep. But I'll explain how we do this. Um, so how did this person get from the first, get from this to this? Well, 
what are the main causes of non-restorative sleep? Well, the same things that are causing autonomic dysfunction, pain, fatigue, dehydration, uh, hypoglycemia in some cases, emotional cognitive stresses. And here's my pictograph, my cartoon of what I've referred to as my energy reserve or your gas tank. Uh, and the idea is sleep is your only, your best chance to put gas in the tank. All these other things and many others deplete your reserves. And the more depleted you get, the more your autonomic nervous system uh, fluctuates. So managing all these stresses as best you can will help improve autonomic function. And that will help improve sleep. So we'll talk some more about how to improve sleep quality. Pain control is really important. Most of my patients underestimate how much pain they're in. They underestimate how much pain is disrupting their sleep. So adequate pain control is important for autonomic dysfunction and important for sleep quality. Don't push through fatigue. If you're exhausted and you keep going anyway, you're borrowing from that reserve, you're further depleting your reserves, you're gonna make your autonomic dysfunction worse. So if you're doing something that involves a lot of effort, take frequent breaks. Uh, as Emily and others have alluded to, adequate salt and fluid is important. Uh, most, of, most people I've found who've been told to eat a lot of salt and drink plenty of water are getting too much water and not enough salt. Um, about 15% of my dysautonomia patients I find have fluctuating blood sugars as a manifestation of their dysautonomia and hypoglycemia is a potent trigger for, for the sympathetic nervous system. So avoiding blood sugar fluctuations can be important in those people. Minimizing emotional other stresses is difficult in the time and days that we live in, unfortunately. So here's another patient, very little, you can see very little deep sleep, lots of awakenings. Um, and on a home sleep monitor, the orange lines are awake and he's basically just awake. Sorry about that. Um, he's basically just awake uh, most of the night, though in these places, he's probably awake asleep, awake asleep, awake asleep. And here's, in this case, this took about six months to correct his sleep. And this is really what your sleep should look like. Two nice big chunks of deep sleep, solid uninterrupted chunks of REM and shallow sleep. So um, if you're not sleeping well, don't overlook the basics. Good sleep hygiene these days means not taking your phone to bed with you. A uh, comfortable mattress, dark and quiet because you're going to tend to overreact to noises and, and light. Uh, so something as simple as a sleep mask can make a big difference. And as I mentioned the cartoon earlier, treating sleep apnea is important, but only if it's significant. So, um, and here's this slide again, sorry. So uh, I do see patients sometimes who have 150 arousals and 25 of them are apnea related. So in those cases, clearly treating the apnea is not gonna make much difference in the quality of your sleep. So various relactation techniques uh, can help before you get to pharmacology treatments. Um, so medication, uh, I put in a lot of slides with details about medications because this is what I get a lot of questions about. I do not have time in 20 minutes to go over all the details, but they're in the slides. Uh, I'll try to make a few important points about each of them as I go. Um, the biggest one being here that most people are going to need uh, some combination of medications. Did I miss that on that slide? Um, so something for pain, something for adrenaline, something to increase deep sleep. Um, so the beta blockers are useful if you're having if, if too much adrenaline is keeping you awake, if you find you get a second wind in the late evening, then taking a long acting beta blocker about an hour before that second wind kicks in, usually about nine o'clock is helpful. If you don't get that, then a short acting beta blocker at bedtime may be sufficient. Um, clonidine suppresses adrenaline production, so it can be helpful, uh, especially in people who are intolerant to beta blockers, say people with asthma. Um, problem with the typically lasts about six hours and when it wears off, it can wear off with rebound and you can wake up with your heart pounding. Uh, Quantocene is a similar drug that lasts longer. So alpha blockers I think are underutilized. Alpha blockers for some reason uh, reduce the, the vividness, the intensity of dreams and nightmares um, with really dramatic efficacy uh, being used in, in military with flashbacks with a 75 to 80% success rate. Um, so if you're 
doing other things to improve your sleep, but you're you're waking up in the morning and remembering details of several different dreams you had during the course of the night, then you should add an alpha blocker to your sleep regimen. Uh, benzodiazepines have some pluses and some minuses. Um, so uh, pain medications, uh, just point out here, uh, gabapentin and pregabalin, because they not only can be effective in various types of pain, especially neuropathic pain, but they're among the few drugs that have been shown to increase deep sleep. Uh, muscle relaxants can be good adjuvants for pain control, and some, like uh, cyclobenzaprine, have been shown to improve sleep quality. Um, antidepressants um, uh, can help both with uh, depression, because depression can affect sleep. Um, there is a mistake on this slide. I'm sorry, the very last line. Uh, Remelteon in this country is Roserum, not Remeron. It's a melatonin analog, which can improve sleep. Then there should be another bullet. Uh, Remeron is Mirtazapine. Um, which can improve appetite and help with weight gain. Uh, and again, is one of the few medications shown to increase deep sleep. So sorry, there's a bullet got lost there. I probably was too tired when I made this slide. So uh, other medications that can often go in the mix. And I warn against using the typical sleeping pills, sulpidem, zopiclom, and zaloplon, because they don't reduce arousals, and they don't increase deep sleep. So I often ask, do you have any data? And, and somewhat sarcastically, I respond, uh, as many of the other speakers have, only the two-legged kind. Um, I've used this paradigm to manage sleep disorders for about 15 or 20 years, and I know it works because my patients tell me that it works. And here's a few quotes from patients who found various medications uh, helpful for them. Again, partly to make the point that different things work for different people. Um, I probably don't have a single patient that's on the same combination of medications that anybody else is. So uh, in summary, uh, the most common type of sleep disorder seen in the hypermobility syndromes appears to be characterized by excess sympathetic activity at night, or um, perhaps more accurately, it might be uh, inadequate parasympathetic activity at night. Um, but medications to suppress, offset, or block the sympathetic activity are effective in improving sleep quality in, in many patients, as measured both by sleep study data and by relief of symptoms. So uh, Emily said, try to remember at least two points maybe from each lecture. This is the most uh, cogent uh, uh, answer that when patients ask me, what do I have to do to get better? Um, so it's all tied up in here. Make your sleep better, reduce the dresses that are draining energy from your system. So if you can uh, reduce pain, minimize other stresses, you can gradually replenish the tank, replenish your reserves, then your autonomic dysfunction will improve, your sleep will improve, then you'll feel better, you'll be able to do more during the day, which will improve your circadian rhythms, that will improve your sleep, and that, in turn, is how people get better. So um, I always thank colleagues for encouraging me along the way. Uh, when I first floated these ideas 15, 20 years ago, most people thought it was crazy. Um, and I always thank my patients for having the confidence in me to let me experiment on them. There's no literature really on, on for example, using the, on the use of beta blockers in this setting that I'm aware of. Um, but I know because my patients have, have tried them that they help. I'm going to close with the recommendation for a couple excellent references on the subject. Thank you for your attention.